Did you know that the Gardener's Workshop offers seed starting supplies? On our site, you'll only find the equipment that we love and use ourselves. It's all Flower Farmer approved. So visit our online store today at thegardenersworkshop.com. The Gardener's Workshop, turning all thumbs green. Hey everyone, welcome to the Field and Garden Podcast. I'm Jesse from The Gardener's Workshop. Today's episode features a takeover of our weekly live Q&A session over on Instagram called Ask a Flower Farmer. This one was hosted by Daniel Shavey of Petal Pickers Flower Co. in Greenville, South Carolina. Daniel is an eighth year flower farmer and an alumnus of most of the Gardener's Workshop's online courses as well. Here, Daniel answers questions on topics such as Mother's Day flowers and pricing, ordering plugs versus starting plants from seed, purchasing and saving ranunculus corms, and so much more. So listen in, and I hope you enjoy. Thanks for joining today. I'm Daniel with Petal Pickers, and today I'm taking over for Lisa for Ask a Flower Farmer Live here on the Gardener's Workshop Farm's Instagram account. So this week is a very special week. It's Mother's Day week. It's our busiest week of selling flowers on our flower farm of the entire year. And it's taken me quite a few years to really nail down what crops we want to grow or we expect to be blooming this week. And I will say this year is year number seven for our flower farm. We've been growing flowers for seven years. A little background on us. We are located in Greenville, South Carolina, zone 8B. And we grow flowers from March all the way through the end of October. And we have a pretty mild climate. So for us, the big holidays of the year are Easter and Mother's Day. And this year, Mother's Day, all the flowers really came together and we just have a complete abundance of blooms. So we ended up having to, we're sold out for shipping nationwide this week, but that's one thing our farm does. We ship flowers nationwide during our growing season and we have just maxed out on the number of bouquets that our farm can produce. So we're actually sending out all of our flowers today. It's Wednesday and we use FedEx to pick up our flowers and deliver them to all of our customers around the country next day on Thursday. So hopefully everyone, if any of you have ordered from us this week, thank you so much. And your flowers should be arriving tomorrow, just in time for them to open up and look gorgeous on Mother's Day. But today you're here to ask me questions. Please ask me any questions you have about growing flowers or how we were able to have tons of flowers available for Mother's Day. But back to this week, so we have snapdragons blooming, Amazon dianthus, we have phlox, campanula, bupleurum. We've been harvesting peonies for the last four weeks. We have even more flowers than that. That's just off the top of my head. I think we have stock blooming and all of these come together to make such beautiful bouquets. We actually have I think we've harvested a thousand sunflowers as of this morning for this week. So we didn't have any sunflowers blooming last week, but over the weekend and then every day this week, we've just been harvesting hundreds of sunflowers and it's been a pretty amazing season, but it hasn't always been like that, right? Like a lot of these things take time for you to really dial in on your farm. Last year, we tried to go grow sunflowers for Mother's Day and we were off by like three days. It was that close. And sometimes that's just a factor of weather and sometimes that's planning. So this year, what we did different with our sunflowers is we planted them out early March, March 1st, and then we covered them for the first probably like five or six weeks. We just left them under row cover until they were pushing up on pushing up the row cover and that's when we had to remove it. And I think that really helped because our sunflowers right now, typically in the past they've been shorter and this year they are like summer sunflower height. It's pretty amazing. And our peonies, it took us a couple years to realize which varieties are going to be the most productive and which ones were going to be blooming before Mother's Day. So really just by taking notes every season we've put together a great Mother's Day plan and 
this year it just happened to work out because it doesn't always work out no matter how much you plan sometimes. But I see there's questions and that's why I'm here. And let's get started. The first question is I wanna start growing tulips hydroponically. What is a good variety to start with? So if you start looking at your supplier catalogs, that information is now being provided. I know Edney Flower Bowl provides that, Leo Burby provides that information and even Ownings, most of the varieties we order from them are able to be grown hydroponically. You can always do a little research online and find that information, but I'll give you a few since you're asking. So Columbus is a great early double blooming tulip. Avant-garde is like a creamy white. Columbus is a pink. Avant-garde's a creamy white that's a good one to force. Akibono is a yellow, is an orange. So those are some good varieties that we have lots of success with. Sometimes we try to push the envelope and if there's some varieties of tulips that maybe we couldn't find that information on, we'll just do a trial and test it out and see if it works. I have heard that the Darwin Hybrid Impression Series tulips don't do well being forced hydroponically. And I think the reason for that is they have so many leaves. They're really susceptible to stem topple. So we always plant our Darwin Impression Series tulips out in the field. And I hope that helps. All right, next question. Do you tend to order in plugs or start from your own seeds or 50-50? That's a great question. When I first started flower farming and the budget was a little tighter, we tried to start everything from seed. And what I've realized over the past few seasons and as our business has grown and really dialed in on the numbers of how much does it cost to pay an employee to water your seeds every day, you know, the cost of seeds versus the cost of plugs, and just the time of, do you have the space, the electricity bill for your heat mats and your lights? Do you have a greenhouse to hold them later? Are you moving your soil block trays from your front porch to back inside at night? All that plays a factor. And so we still, I would say we're about 50-50 right now. Over the last seven years, like I said, from starting all of our stuff from seed, it gave us a great foundation to learn what grows really easy from seed. So certain things, there's some grasses like sprinkles or frosted explosion or sunflower seeds or zinnia seeds. Why would I order in plugs of that? Unless it was just a timing thing and you really did not want to water those every day because those seeds are so easy to start from seed. It's it's really hard to fail at those. So that kind of stuff, we still grow from seed. We grow most of our celosias from seed, especially if we save seed from the year before. And so there's lots of things that we do that with. We even grew lisianthus from seed this year, but I really don't recommend that. Even though we were able to do it successfully, just we had that held up in our greenhouse on our potting benches for months. And now looking back, I'm like, I really could have used that space for something else instead of just holding them, watering them every day. It didn't make any sense, but a lot of things I like to trial myself. I like to learn. I kind of get a high from doing something that's supposed to be hard, like starting Lysianthus from seed. To me, that's interesting and fun. And I think it's a good thing to learn, but looking back, we should have just ordered in plugs. And then once they arrived, we plant them in the ground and we didn't have to take care of them for three months because that would have saved us a lot of money. All right, next question. Just got my dahlia tubers. I live in Ohio, still getting decent rain. Do I plant them in the garden or plant in pots to control the water? And that's all the part of the question I can see. I would look at your forecast. You're not too late at all to plant dahlia tubers. I think in Ohio, you could probably still plant them through the end of June. I know we can here in South Carolina. And so look at your forecast. When you're planting dahlia tubers, you do want the soil to have some kind of moisture in there. Otherwise your tubers aren't gonna sprout that fast. I know there's a farmer nearby and we were really dry the last few weeks until recently. They planted their dahlia tubers about a week before I planted mine and we're not finished planting. We just started. We only planted our first round a couple of days ago, but I was talking to my other farmer friend and 
She said because she planted them dry, she hadn't really seen much growth from them yet. So hopefully all the rain we just received recently will help them get started in sprouting. My point is you want there to be moisture in the soil. You just don't want to plant them when your ground is still cold and you have a lot of rain in the forecast. So if it looks like it's just going to rain every day for multiple days in a row and you don't see the sunshine on your weather forecast, you may want to hold off until you see where you're going to get a break in the rain to plant. But soil temperature is probably the most important part. If your soil is colder than 60 degrees, your dahlia tubers aren't really going to be happy. And even though you think I'm getting them in early, they're just going to sit there and wait for the soil to warm up to 60 degrees to start growing. So then if you get a lot of rain and they haven't been growing roots the whole time they've been planted, that's when you see a lot of rot. So be careful about soil temperature, but I think now most of the country is pretty good to start planting unless you know you're in a colder zone and if you have a lot of rain in your forecast. Okay, I think I see another question here. Heaven Scent Flower Farm, I purchased your tuberose and planted them yesterday. Any growing or harvesting tips you can share? So if you're in Texas zone 8B, that means you're gonna be really warm, which is great for tuberose. I would have told you if you're in a colder growing zone, you may wanna plant them in a high tunnel to give them the extra heat they want. But in Texas, you're not gonna have a problem with tuberose. I will say they like fertilizer once you get them established and started growing. So don't be afraid to fertilize your tuberose. And also once they're active, they like a lot of water. I've grown them on the drier side unintentionally before. And I noticed that when I really paid attention and gave them a lot of water, especially if it's if you're not getting a lot of rain that you can easily notice the benefit. You'll get more blooms and more spikes, but honestly, plant the tuberose, like we said in our growing instructions, one or two inches below the soil and get them watered in well. Make sure you keep them weeded throughout the season and you should see lots of blooms. I love tuberose because of the scent and our event florists love them for weddings too. So it's a great, flower to grow. And we do still have those on our website at the moment at petalpickers.com. We can ship those out. We also have dahlia tubers. And again, we ship flowers nationwide. If you want to send a box of flowers to a friend this season. Next question, what type of peonies are best in terms of production and in time for Mother's Day? So in time for Mother's Day is very important because that depends on where you live across the country. So for us in Greenville, South Carolina, we're very fortunate. We get enough chill hours in the winter that we're able to grow most of the varieties of herbaceous peonies. The latest blooming ones don't do well for us. So we do have to look into that. Sarah Bernhardt is a great productive light pink peony and it's not that expensive to buy the roots. And that is our latest blooming one in our production. But in other climates, if you're a lot cooler, there's probably, that's probably not the latest blooming variety that a lot of people plant. So it's gonna be specific to where you live. Estiva Maxima for us has an amazing scent and it's probably right now our most productive peony. And we just get tons and tons of bloom off that one. Bowl of Cream is a newer one for us, but it seems like it's growing pretty quick. It's on year two for us and we got a number of stems off of it. A lot of people will tell you not to cut the peonies until year three, but for me, if they look like they're healthy and we get a lot of stems on it, I'm gonna cut a couple and try to sell them to make some of my money back. Other ones, let's see, Coral Charm is an early blooming variety and I like that one. Lemon Chiffon is a little more expensive, but it's a yellow herbaceous peony and I like that one. And Kansas is a good, more magenta color. And Duchess de Nemour is a white that's super popular and also not too expensive to buy in a lot of roots. So those are some varieties. I hope that helps. There's so many different varieties of peonies. Oh, but before I go on to the next question, etch salmon is an expensive, to me, it's a higher priced, variety of peony, but it's my absolute favorite. So if you can get your hands on a couple of those, I don't think you'll go wrong by investing the money. Okay, someone asked me, do you mark up sales more for Mother's Day? 
And the answer to that question is yes, because demand is highest for us the entire year for Mother's Day. So technically we've already sold out of our flowers this week twice. I just keep upping the number because our fields keep producing and I kind of pushed it to the max this year. But of course, during any holiday, you're gonna wanna increase your prices slightly, make the most that you can. This week, we can literally sell every flower that we have the ability and time to cut and pull out from our fields. And so why would you not maximize your opportunity with that? That is what you wanna do. So we did increase our prices from week to week. If you look at the national way flowers are sold throughout the wholesale market and other avenues, everyone takes advantage of this a holiday. It's the same way with Valentine's Day, the same day with Easter. So of course, as a business, you that's just part of being in retail or whatever business you're in. Even the wholesale markets increase their flower prices too. So we just kind of follow suit. Quick, I have not grown any Ito peonies. I've heard the base life on those is a little less. So why would I grow those for our production when we're wanting to ship flowers across the country. They have a little bit of a transit time there. We're storing them in our coolers to hold them until Mother's Day. So we don't want anything like that. There's some really amazing colors in Ito peonies and I know a flower, I know a lot of flower farmers do grow them. So it's something to look into. But for me, I've never planted a single one on our farm because that just didn't make sense for our production. Next question, do you grow white phlox paniculata for summer weddings? So our white phlox is blooming right now. That's when ours is. So it's a perennial, I think ours is called like early crystal or something crystal white phlox. And what's nice about it is it's not as susceptible to powdery mildew, which can be very common, especially on older varieties growing flocks in the south. They are easily susceptible to powdery mildew. I've grown this variety now for three or four weeks, and I think it also comes in a few different colors, but we do not see any powdery mildew on it. So I don't know the name exactly. It's something like that, like early crystal flocks. Try to try to do a search and find it because I do recommend that one. It has a slight lavender hue after it's been in the cooler for a couple days. So that's something that threw us off a little bit, but now I just put it on my product description when we're selling to florist and they know now that it says that and they still love it. It's a good one. And you harvest that white phlox when only a couple blooms have started to open and then you'll get pretty decent base life on it. Okay, next question. What vendor do you use to buy your ranunculus corms from? So there's a few different wholesale suppliers across the whole country that sell ranunculus corms. If you are an established business with the proper licensing and everything, you're able to order from wholesalers. So for us, a couple of them right off the top of my head are Ownings Holland, Leo Burby Bulb Co, and Ball Horticulture is who we've sourced ranunculus corms from in the past. Okay, next question. How and when to harvest allium gladiators specifically? How long can you hold them in the cooler? I'm so sorry. I, I think I can grow allium. I tried them a few years ago and didn't do well with them. I think I'm, I probably did something wrong, but I haven't tried them since. So I really have no information to offer for that. I know there's the specialty cut flowers, like har post harvest and handling book. And I bet you could find information on alliums in there. I use that for a lot when I have questions about how to harvest flowers at the right stage. Next question is I bought ranunculus for the first time at a garden nursery. What's the best way to save my corms for next season? So if you want to save your ranunculus corms, I haven't had the best look of the best luck of them producing as well the following year but I'll tell you what to do. So you let your ranunculus go dormant once the temperatures start to warm up. And so you'll notice all the leaves turn yellow and you wanna wait until that foliage is yellow or died back. And then you can pull up the ranunculus or dig it up. You cut the foliage off and then store all of those ranunculus corms in a crate. I've heard you wanna wash them off and you want to make sure that they are completely 
dry. And I think in the past I've had issues with them molding during storage because even though I thought they were dry, I don't think I waited long enough for them to fully dry out. So I've even heard if you lay them out on drying racks, keep them there for like two to three weeks and then you know that they're dry and you can put fans on them or whatever to have good airflow where you're drying them out. But I think that's the key is you wanna wash the dirt off and make sure they completely dry out. And then you just store them somewhere hot and dry all summer. So if you have a workshop or a barn, if you have really high humidity like me, you wanna, may wanna think about that. So I put it up in my bonus room here in our house that's air conditioned. And that way it's staying at like 70 degrees. But you just wanna keep them dry all summer until you're ready to start them again in the fall. And then you just soak them to reactivate them and go from there. All right, next question. Do you think it's too late to plant tuberose in Florida zone 9B? So I'm not exactly sure. I haven't grown tuberose in zone 9B. Don't think it's too late. I'm pretty sure you could still start it and you're gonna be warm enough the entire season. It's probably gonna grow really well. I have a friend on the panhandle of Florida and she's planted our tuberose from us earlier in the season and it did really well. I, I can't really imagine why it wouldn't do well, even starting it now. Someone's asking me, Gigi says, how did you start off? I wanna start growing cut flowers, but I'm thinking I need space. Is it possible to start off small? Yes, it's definitely possible to start off small. And here at the Gardener's Workshop Farm, there's all kinds of resources and online courses you can take to really get you started. If you wanna learn how to grow flowers or start a business or even just grow flowers at your home, this is where I started teaching myself from was taking Lisa's online courses and following her on social media with her lives. And that's a great place to start. You can start really small. You just need some raised beds, some good potting soil and get you some seeds and you can hit the ground running. Lisa just released a new book that has information on how to grow cutting gardens in small spaces. So head over to the Gardener's Workshop Farms website and you can order that book now. And that's where I would recommend starting to learn how to grow cut flowers in a small space. All right, next question. After you cut ranunculus, do you put it in a chiller? I notice sometimes after I pull it out of my cooler, a few of them droop. So we, I think you may be harvesting your ranunculus a little too early. So wait until the bloom fully opens and that the center, you wanna make sure it's not blown completely open. But if you get the ranunculus, like that Italian ranunculus or the amnidine series, it's gonna have lots and lots of layers of petals to it. So let the outer ones open up. And then in the center, when it's still kind of tight, that's like the perfect stage to harvest a ranunculus. I have a reel on my Instagram at Petal Pickers you can go watch that shows exactly what I'm talking about. But once you do that and you put them in, the, in your cooler, keep them pretty cold at like 38 degrees to hold them. And you shouldn't notice that as much. If you don't think you're doing that, I'm not sure exactly, but most of our ranunculus don't really droop after pulling them out of the cooler. Next question, I planted zinnia seeds two weeks ago and they came out, but they're very long and thin. Where am I wrong? So did you plant them outside in the yard or are you starting those indoors under grow lights? If you don't have enough light directly above the zinnia seeds, they are gonna come out a little thin, scraggly. Also, it could have been just too much water, too much clouds, I don't know. I think if you're doing them under grow lights, just make sure your lights are strong enough. And we, we usually don't have that problem starting our zinnia seeds. So that hopefully that's something that you can look out for. Just make sure they're getting enough light and direct light from the sun. My zinnias look light green and yellow with spots. What's wrong? Not powdery mildew. They probably, they don't sound like they're very happy. If you're growing them in plug trays, again, I need to know like, are you starting them in the ground outside? If they're in plug trays, they may be root bound. So we only leave our zinnia seeds in our plug trays for like two weeks. And then we want to plant them out in the field or our raised beds or wherever we're putting them right after that. So if you've been, if you started your zinnia seeds maybe a little too early, they may not be happy with you right now. They may need a little fertilizer if they're 
growing yellow, or you may have some kind of fungus growing on the leaves and you may need to apply a, fung a fungicide to help take care of that. The spots are kind of what's throwing me off that I think you might have something funky going on that a fungicide maybe could help clear that up. You, there's organic options for fungicide if you wanted to try that out. But honestly, if they look too bad, I would start new seeds in fresh potting soil. So if you're, if you're adding compost, you wanna make sure your compost isn't too hot or something's going on with that. So hopefully that helps. Where can I find boxes to be able to ship flowers? So we use a local box manufacturer near us. They're five minutes down the street from us. If you go onto Google, search local box manufacturing or box manufacturer near me, that's what's gonna work. There are lots of options online. I've done the research. Those are gonna be more expensive to ship them to you and more expensive per box price. If you wanna get started without in investing a lot of money, there's a company called Uline. It's all about packing and shipping supplies and you can start there. A lot of people don't necessarily like the company for their moral values, but they are very convenient and most people I know that pack and ship across the country have ordered from Uline and know who that is. So that's just something to look into or think about, but start with looking there and then we order our boxes in like thousand count quantities. So that's where we get all our custom designs and everything. That's when it makes sense. So we're getting our boxes. They're less than a dollar per box to give you a reference point. And if you're ordering online in smaller quantities, the price is gonna be higher. Hope that helps. All right, a couple more questions here. What foliage and greens do you have this time of year to add to Mother's Day bouquets? So this year we harvested some of our hellebore leaves and that has proven to be an amazing addition to our lineup this year. We finally have some established hellebore plants and we're not taking all the leaves off the plant but we're cutting a few leaves off of each plant and kind of spreading the harvest through our crop and that has been great. We also grow bupleurum. We grow it from seed and we order in plugs and we plant bupleurum in the fall here and then we do another planting in early spring around like Valentine's Day or earlier, and th that's what we have blooming now for those. Our eucalyptus is overwintered in a high tunnel, and technically, for one of our bouquets this week, we did cut some eucalyptus, so that has been good. And Solomon Seal is an amazing perennial. I never have enough of it, but we use that in our Mother's Day bouquets as well. Certain things like that, it depends on where you live. If you're further up north, your Solomon seal may not be blooming yet, your Bupleurum may not be ready yet, but for us, we do have a few options this time of year. Also, let's see, rosemary or something that's a little more evergreen, that could be an option. If you're in a colder zone, you may still wanna look into some evergreen options like that. Okay, another question. Do you direct sow your sunflowers or use plug trays? We've done both. What I do now, just to stay organized and for the employees, since I have them sowing our sunflower trays, is we use 128 cell plug trays, just like Lisa does at the Gardener's Workshop Farm. We sow our seeds in there, we grow them, we start them under grow lights or in our greenhouse, and then after about 10 days, we plant them out in the field. So this last question is from Barefoot Blooms. Sorry, did you mention what zone your farm is in? Do you grow in a greenhouse or high tunnel? Yes, our zone, our growing zone is, I believe here, it just got upgraded from 7B to 8A. I've been telling people we're zone eight for ever since I started. And we have a greenhouse that we grow seeds and start things. Right now we have lilies growing in there and then we have all of our dahlia cuttings in there. And we have 12 high tunnels now on our farm. So a lot of those high tunnels I got from Farmer's Friend, LLC. It's a company out of Tennessee. And then the two largest ones we just got a grant for from the NRCS to help pay or provide some of the funding for that. And we got those from a local greenhouse manufacturer Atlas Greenhouses there in Georgia, which is right next to South Carolina. So that was, that's kind of how you want to decide on which, which greenhouse or high tunnel provider you want to order from. Just they're all across the country. Order the, from someone that's really close to you and you'll save on shipping because that stuff is heavy and it costs a lot for shipping. So 
Thank you for your questions. It was nice to hang out with everybody today, and this was a lot of fun. So thanks for having me, Lisa, and the Gardener's Workshop Farm team. And I hope everyone out there that's a mom has a great Mother's Day. And I know everyone's, if you're a flower farmer this week, you're really busy. So I hope the best for everyone. Thank y'all, I'll see you later. Okay, welcome back. Doesn't Daniel offer some great advice? I hope you found useful bits of info in there. So I've included some links in the show notes to topics that were mentioned, including a link to Daniel's social media and the Petal Pickers website. If you're interested in attending a Ask a Flower Farmer live Q&A, you'll find them weekly on Instagram each Wednesday at 12.30 p.m. Eastern Time. These sessions are normally hosted by Lisa Mason Ziegler, but we do have guest takeovers such as this one periodically as well, so I encourage you to check it out. If you like what you're hearing here on the Field and Garden podcast, we'd love it if you'd tell a friend about us and leave a review for us wherever you get your podcasts. That's all for me today. Thank you for joining me, flower friends. I'm Jesse from the Gardener's Workshop, and I hope you have a great day. Mm-hmm.